Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. It's good to see you. I'm sorry for the missed class last week. Um, uh, nice to see all your familiar faces here or some of your names uh, and to be here together again. Um, today, we're going to talk about one of the most enigmatic, complicated, heart-rending relationships, to my opinion, in the entire uh, book of Genesis and the entire book of Bereshit, which is a relationship between two brothers, Yaakov and Esav, Jacob and Esav. And the reason I call it enigmatic, and we will see it at length when we unpack it together today, is that the text itself, the pshat, the narrative as it is written in the book of Genesis, doesn't vilify um, itself. It doesn't kind of turn the story into the bad brother and the good brother. It shows us two very different brothers and their complicated relationships and how their parents' actions complicate their relationships, etc. cetera. But um, since this one fragile, complicated relationship became kind of um, the schematic foreshadowing in our culture of our relationship with Christianity, our relationship with Rome, our relationship with all the entities we identify with a sub over, you know, over history. Um, many commentators, both religious and not religious, and by the way, also Christians, went back to the story of Jacob and Esav and read into it or unpacked from within it um, other layers or other possible interpretations that overall tended to present Esav as much more negative, uh, much more problematic uh, than he is presented in the simple words of the text. Which makes our job when we're trying to see what the story, what the biblical story has to say about relationships a little bit difficult when we're trying to figure out what this story can teach us about relationships because we need to kind of dig our way through layers of interpretations that have to do less with interpersonal relationships and more with, there I call it, international relationships between nations um, and dig through all of that, unpack all of this and try and find the human connections as they are hiding within it. And I don't think that there's a perfect way of doing that. I don't think anyone can really unpack and undo all of the baggage that history pinned on it because the baggage has good reasons. The reasons are not only events that happen later in history. There's also a lot of nuance and a lot of complexity in the text. And it's very, very hard to form one coherent, definitive reading of it. You can really open it many ways. So I can't promise you to do the reading of the relationship of Yaakov and Esau. But what we will try to read is really read it as it is told, without the layers of Midrash added later, that we will refer to them at the very end a little bit. Um, and what we will also try to do is we will try to put ourselves in the shoes of the people in the story and use our own human experiences to illuminate a little bit more um, some of this text. Excuse me for a second. Okay, here I am. So I want to start actually not in the beginning. I want to start at a crisis moment in Jacob's life. Two weeks ago in our last session, we talked about Isaac and Rebecca. They get together and they have the babies and we will go back to that moment when they have their babies, et cetera, et cetera. But where I want to start today is the crisis moment. It's not when the babies are born. It's not when they're conceived. It's not when they grow up side by side. It's not when they have their first fraught encounter or the very complicated and painful story of the theft of the blessings, all of which we will touch upon later today. I want to jump straight to what happens after, when the family falls apart, when out of fear for Jacob, because she, Rebecca, overhears Esav threatening to kill Jacob, she orchestrates sending him out of his home uh, and to her brother's home in Haran. And then there's the moment when Jacob leaves his home, leaves his family, and goes out into the world. Now, it's easy to jump ahead in the story and say, and then he has a dream about a ladder with this ad to the sky and 
bottom and earth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then he meets Rachel, and then he marries Leah. The, the, Jacob's story is so thick with events that it's easy to just keep moving from one to the next. But I want to really pause. I want to really stop and focus on that moment when Jacob is leaving his home. Let's look at the pasuk. Let's look at the verse. The verse says as following. I'm in the source sheet in box one if you have it printed and prefer to look at it this way. In Genesis 28, um, it's a mistake here. It's just verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Chavad. Except that's not what it says. It says not left Beersheba. It says Vayetse. He went out of. The verb going out, the verb going out of in Hebrew, Vayetse, um, places the emphasis not on the destination, but rather on the origin point. What's important here is not um, his purpose, his mission. Jacob personally has two missions, one to evade his brother and the other, as we will discuss later, to find a wife. That's not the point. When you use the verb vayetse, the emphasis is that you're no longer in. There's an in and you're no longer part of it. I'm not saying that the story doesn't go on to say what his purpose is. It does say and set out for Haran. He has a destination in mind. He's not like Abraham wondering, unknowing, without knowing where he's going to land in the end. He knows where he's going. But the verb that's used to describe his leaving is vayetse. I want to give you two other examples, the two other times that this particular verb in this particular um, way is used in the story of Jacob's family. One is one we already saw last week, not last week, two weeks ago, last class, when we discussed uh, Isaac and Rebecca's marriage. I'm jumping ahead to Genesis 24, 63. And Isaac went out walking in the field toward evening and looking up, he saw camels approaching. In Hebrew, vayetse itzchak lasuach basadeh. So lasuach basadeh, to walk in the field, even though some commentators say it's more accurate to say to pray in the field or to converse in the field, gives us his goal. There's a mission. There's something he's going to do. But first, what we know is that he's going out. Now, we already know that what follows is a moment of great transformation. This is a moment when he meets his wife, Rebecca, who's going to rock his world and change him and change his life and unlock a lot of his potential and make him, in a sense, the hero of the story instead of Abraham, enable him to become the hero of the story, to step into the center stage place, the limelight, so to speak. And in a sense, knowing that, we go back to this verb, the verb by itse, itzhak, and he went out, and we can see in it not only um, physical descriptor of a man walking the field, a man going from one place to another, but rather a descriptor of a state of mind. Here is a man who is open for change, who is ready to change. He's going out of whoever he used to be, of the place where he used to be. Something gets unstuck and now something can happen. It's even more this kind of subtle shading of this verb or the subtle connotation of this verb becomes even clearer in the other vayetse that's in this family story. And this is the vayetse that describes the birth of Esav, not Jacob, Esav. I'm going to the middle quote here, Genesis 25, 25. The first one, the first baby emerged in Hebrew, vayetse, went out, red, like a hairy mantle all over, so they named him Esav. What is more total, what is more complete in terms of going out than coming out of the womb? For nine months, the baby sits in the womb with a sense of place, a sense of how things work. The body of the baby is fitted for feeding and getting everything it needs and doing everything it needs in the womb. And suddenly there's this trauma of birth. Obviously, we don't see it as such. We see it, uh, um, we see it as uh, a wonderful, miraculous, wonderful thing. But uh, the, the, the experience of the baby, if you try and put yourself in the shoes and the feet, so to speak, of the baby, and imagine it, it's a total change. Now the baby has to accustom itself to a totally new set of rules. So it's very appropriate to use this verb, the verb of vayetse. It's like, you're out. Whatever was, was. But now you're hanging out there and you need to figure it all out again. 
And it's very appropriate that in the little family drama of four vo with four voices of Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, and Esav, this verb is used to describe the moment when Jacob steps out of it for the first time. He's no longer defined by it. He has to run away from it. He can no longer be part of this family drama. He has to go elsewhere and he will find elsewhere. And next week we will dis discuss the elsewhere and what he finds there at great length because he forms other very significant relationships there. But I, I really wanted to start with that moment, the moment when whatever was is in the past, is in the in, in the system you're no longer part of, and you're hanging there before you have something new to anchor you, before you have a new system that defines who you are and what's your place in the world. To understand how Jacob gets to this point and to understand what happens after he gets to this point, we need to understand what was the in, what was the system that defined him and through which he defined himself for the first stage of his life. And this is going to be the bulk of what we do now. I noticed in the comments that people pointed out that Lea and Dina will later be described with the same verb, Vatetse, It is significant, and we'll talk about it when we talk about um, Jacob's familial relationships in the family he forms, as opposed to the family he's born into um, in the next few weeks. But today we're really going to focus on his birth family. So let's start, let's get introduced to who are the actors in the drama that plays out in the household of Isaac and Rebecca. And I'm going to the source sheet um, to box number two. This is the story of Isaac, son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Of course, in Hebrew, story is not exactly right. It's toldot, it means the generations, um, it's a little more, it's a history, it's a little more general, but many commentators pointed out that it's significant that when we say, what is the story of Isaac, the first thing we know about him is that he's Abraham's son, which fits into what we discussed last time, namely that Isaac is very much a follower. He is the man whose job is to take his father's great original covenant with God and follow it, keep on walking in the same path instead of creating a new path. So we already have a little bit of a sense of the father in this scene. Isaac was 40 years old when he took to wife Rebecca, daughter of Betuel the Aramean of Padan Aram, sister of Lavan the Aramean. Why do we need to know about her father and brother? Why is it significant? Other than the fact that we're doing a genealogical description here, why is it significant at this point? We'll come back to that. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And the Lord responded to his plea and his wife, Rebecca, conceived. This is a short verse and yet an odd one. A more natural way to describe it would be Rebecca was barren. She had no children. And therefore, Isaac prayed to God to, um, to give her children and God complied. Usually this is how the biblical story goes. It goes chronologically, it tells us this happened and therefore this happened and therefore this happened. Here it's as if the fact of the barrenness is swallowed up, it's minimized, it's pushed into a clause because she was barren. It's almost an aside, an afterthought. Just, oh yeah, I need to, the important thing is that he prayed and got kids. Oh yeah, she was barren, so he had to do that. And this is another significant hint here. The fact that the barrenness is not center stage, but rather the prayer and God's acquiescence. And we'll come back to why later. We'll ask why later. But his children, the children struggled in her womb. In Hebrew, it says, va'itotsetsu. And the commentators ask, what on earth does this mean? This is a weird wording. The children did what in her womb, in her inside? So one interpretation is struggled, indeed. Another interpretation can, be, um, can have to do with hitting each other. It's not just struggling with each other, it's the actual act of hitting 
there's a word in Hebrew, legotzes. It's a terrible word. It's used for description of killing people with a rock or things. It's like really hitting someone hard enough to kill. So that's another interpretation. Another interpretation, um, which has very nice kind of shadow later in the story, and we'll come to this again later, is running. Ritza in modern Hebrew, you say laots to run. And there is indeed this meaning here that maybe they're just running from place to place and moving so intensively within her womb that they're causing her this feeling that there's a race going on inside her. But what's interesting here is not just the fact that her babies are behaving in this um, unusually active, perhaps violent way. What's interesting is her response because Rebecca doesn't go to her husband. Rebecca doesn't ignore it. Rebecca, the woman whom we met last week and whom we saw being active and taking initiative and taking control of a situation and responding to things and asking questions of the slaves when she sees Isaac and wants to know who he is, does the same thing here. She takes initiative. First of all, she comes up with a question and then she finds someone to address the question to. And the question is interesting. The question in Hebrew is, Lama ze anuchi? They translate it here, why do I exist? And it's an odd question because it's very open mind, open ended. She doesn't say, why do my babies run around? She doesn't say, why is my pregnancy so difficult? She's saying, why do I exist? She takes the particular moment, the event that's happening within her belly, and takes it to a broader place, to a deeper, more philosophical questioning. And then she doesn't turn to her husband. She doesn't turn to um, you know, one of the other women around her. She goes to God himself. She went to inquire of the Lord. We don't know exactly what it means. And the Lord answered her, two nations are in your womb. Two separate peoples shall issue from your body. One people shall be mightier than the other, and the older shall serve the young. Within these um, five verses, yeah, five verses, we already see several things. We see the seeds of the drum. We see Isaac, who talks to God, but doesn't talk to Rebecca and who has a very special relationship with God. The emphasis is on his prayer and God answering him and not on the problem that Rebecca has, the barrenness that necessitates this relationship at this moment or activates the relationship. So we have Isaac, whose relationship is with God. We have Rebecca, who also relates to God on her own, separately, not through her husband, not next to her husband, but in her own way, and who again takes initiative. And before we ever meet the actual people, we already know that these two babies have national significance and that they're going to be tied to each other in the bond of struggle and of mastery versus servility. There's some power play that has to happen between the two of them. And into this stage with these players that we already see to some extent, step Isaac and Jacob. And what follows now, uh, not Isaac and Jacob, sorry, Esav and Jacob. And what follows now are three instances in which the biblical story very carefully contrasts them. None of them stands on their own. There's no Jacob did this and this and this, or Esav did this and this and this. There's three points where we see them presented together. Esav did this, Jacob did that. Esav was loved by this, Jacob was loved by that. And what we will see if we read them carefully, and here I'm following the interpretation of uh, Rabbi Jonathan Grossman in his book about Jacob, Jacob's story of a family. I know it's in Hebrew. I don't know if it's translated into English yet, but I know it's in the process of being translated at least, if not already published. Either way, you know, Rabbi Jonathan Grossman points out that each of those moments of contrast that places the two brothers kind of opposed to each other, on the one hand, clearly contrast them. We're clearly invited by the wording of the text to compare these two individuals and see how different they are. But at the same time, each of these comparisons is not exactly a perfect mirror image. There's something there that 
is grading. It doesn't create a perfect contrast. So we will go and look at them and then discuss what it can mean. Let's look at it together. I'm in box number three. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in our womb. We're not surprised. We already heard the prophecy or the oracle and we know. And now let's see how they're contrasted. The first one emerged by Yetze, we already said that, red, entirely red, kulo, it says in Hebrew, like a hairy mantle all over. So they named him Esav. We see a baby who's characterized by a physical, the first thing we know about him is a physical attribute of himself. And they, whoever they are, give him the name Esav. Commentators have tried to understand how Esav, what Esav has to do with his hairiness or his hair. And they said that maybe it's Esav is very similar to the word Asui, which means made, complete, because it was a hairy, like an older person, like an like a already matured person. There's other interpretation. It doesn't matter for our purposes. What matters for our purposes is that what we know about him has something to do with his physical um, his physical um, appearance and that whoever named him was plural. Maybe it's Yitzhak and Rebecca, maybe it's Rebecca and her women, maybe it's Isaac and Abraham, we don't know, but it's not one person who named him. Then his brother emerged holding on to the heel of a sav. So they named him, it's not they, it's he named him Jacob. It looks very similar, right? We hear about one coming out, emerging, and then the other coming out. We hear something about the first and something about the second, and we hear the name of the first and the name of the second, but the parallel is broken because what we hear about the first, the characteristic we hear about the first has to do with his physical appearance, whereas the other one, we hear something he did, an action, him holding the heel of his brother. And the name, his name, Yaakov, has to do with the word Akev, heel. It has to do with that action he was born with, holding the heel of his brother. So it's not exactly parallel. A physical descriptor and a descriptor of an action are not exactly the same. And then in the first one, plural, many people called him Esav, whereas in the second, he named him Jacob, presumably Isaac. By the way, the entire drama there, the entire drama of barrenness and the prayer, which is kind of swallowed up in the clause of one verse, like we saw before, here we find out that it actually took 20 years because here we hear that um, Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. There are 20 years of barrenness and prayer before the babies are born, and yet those 20 years are irrelevant. The storyteller doesn't want to draw our attention to them. He wants us to know they existed, but they're not the important part. The important part is that when Isaac, Isaac calls, God responds. And when Rebecca feels something, she goes to God with her question. And we'll keep coming back to that. Anyway, sorry, this was the first comparison. Two brothers, both emerging, but the comparison doesn't quite use the equal terms to present them as mirror images of each other. We will see the exact same thing when we hear about how they are like when they grow up. When the boys grew up, I'm looking below in the same box, box three, Esav became a skillful hunter, a man of the outdoors, but Jacob was a mild man who stayed in the camp. Again, on the, on the face of it, it looks kind of like a contrast, right? One of them is outdoorsy, does things outside. One of them is indoorsy, sits indoors. And yet again, the comparison isn't perfect because what we learn first about Asaf is that he was a skillful hunter, right? The parallel or the contrast in Jacob is that he was a mild man, Ishtam, a wholesome man in Hebrew. The first has to do with a profession. The second has to do with a character trait. It's not exact, it doesn't quite line up. Then we do hear that Esav was also a man of the outdoors while Jacob was a man who sat in tents, which does sound more like it's a mirror image of one another, but it only emphasizes that the first part of the comparison doesn't quite line up. And the same imperfection, the same imperfect contrasting runs to the last of the three instances of description here in verse 28. 
Isaac favored the sap. In Hebrew, it's vayeha, actually the word love. It's like love is sap. Because he had a taste for game. What it actually says in Hebrew is kitsai befi, because he had side, he had game in his mouth. But Rebecca and Rebecca loved Jacob, except it doesn't say favorite or love, it says loves. The way the verb is constructed in Hebrew is different. Vayehav Yitzchak Yaakov means that he came to love him because. Verivka ohevet et Yaakov is more of a present um, that continues. It's a description of a continuous state. Rebecca loves Jacob, goes on loving Jacob. Once again, it looks like we have a contrast. You know, here is the man who is his father's favorite, and here is the son who is his mother's favorite. But the terminology is different in two ways. First of all, the verb is different. In Isaac, we hear about him coming to love Esau, whereas Rebecca goes on loving Jacob. And the second difference, of course, is that in Esau's case, we have a reason. We're told why Isaac loves Yitzchak. It's a weird reason. We don't quite understand it, but we're told what it is. Whereas in the case of Rebecca, love of Jacob, there's no explanation. What I want to suggest when we look at these contrasts that are so um, almost exactly mirror image and yet not quite a mirror image of one another because the terms of their descriptions are different and change from point to point. What I want to suggest is that in a sense, the way the biblical storyteller shapes these contrasts draws our attention to the unresolvable tension of being a brother. We talked about it before when we talked about Cain and Abel, Cain and Hevel. And I mentioned that in Hebrew, the word ach, brother, can be completed to be achel, other, or echad, one. And that in many ways, one's brother or one sibling, if we want to broaden it to include girls in the story, um, one sibling is in many ways one's, the one who is most like us, the one who shares our history and genetic material and ex childhood experiences, but also the most other than us. Because when we grow up together, he's our eternal foil. He's whoever it is we define ourselves against. He's the one we say we're not like him because we are this. She's the pretty one, I'm the smart, smart one. He's the strong one, I'm the studious one. He's the outgoing one, the, the class clown one, then I'm gonna be the nerd one. We always define ourselves judging by the people around us and especially our peers. And a sibling is the closest and most intimate of those. So there's something in being a sibling that it always exists in this weird continuous tension of affinity and utter difference of being alike and yet not alike. And this kind of tension runs through these contrasts between Esav and Yaakov, where they could almost say that they're the mirror image of each other, and yet they're not quite. They're not quite, they don't quite fit into the scheme. There's such an easy scheme. It's like almost perfect. We could almost say, oh, it's very easy. They're exactly the opposite, like in a fairy tale. One is like this and the other, one is white, one is black, and therefore the story progresses as it is. But it doesn't quite fit. They're just not, they're different, but they're not exactly opposites. And there's something there that makes it complicated, that makes it unresolvable, that leaves us as readers feeling that things don't line up as we might expect them to. And in a sense, reproduces the feeling that perhaps Jacob and herself felt growing up of things not quite lining up, of they almost have the exact opposite places in the family, but not quite. They're almost each other's foil, but not quite. And as we will see later today, in many ways, this tension, the second it becomes violent, as was foretold to Rebecca, cannot be resolved without separation. As long as they're constantly defining themselves in contrast to one another, they can never fully make it work. They can't fully. Um, make order of their life together. But so far, all we heard was about who they are. Let's see the first scene when we see them actually in action, interacting with one another. 
And this scene reveals a lot both about their relationship and what it was like for them growing up together as these different, but not that different, but maybe more different brother and brother. And also it reveals more about the differences between them. And this is the famous scene of uh, selling the right of the firstborn. I wanna first say that there's a lot of mysteries in this scene. Esav, by virtue of being, coming out of the womb minutes earlier, is the firstborn. And Jacob wants to buy this right of him. But what does it mean? We know both from the Torah and from parallel cultures at the time in Mesopotamia, that the father is the one who determines who's the firstborn, who gets the right of the firstborn. The father decides that Yehuda and not Reuven, for example, one generation down the line, will be the heir of the covenant or the leader of his family. So what does it mean? Why, why does it matter to Jacob to buy it from himself? He should focus on buying his father's favor. Why is he even getting it from himself? What does it mean? We don't know. Some commentators suggest that what we're talking about here is monetary issues. The firstborn gets double in inheritance and that Jacob is trying to get that. But even that doesn't seem quite right because what we know, at least from other Mesopotamian cultures, again, we don't have enough uh, substantive evidence of this in Tanakh in the Bible to say from there. But what we know from parallel cultures is that um, it, those kinds of deals are not, can't be defined as I buy your right of the firstborn, but rather I buy a piece of property from you. There were contracts like this. But the form of contract that Esav and Jacob form in this scene, which we will read now, where Jacob just buys the right of the firstborn, whatever it means, don't mean anything in contractual terms in the ancient world. So we don't even know what's going on here. Setting this mystery aside and assuming that the people participating in the story do know what they're talking about and that it means something to them, Let's see how they relate to each other surrounding it. Once, when Jacob, I'm in box four, sorry. Once, when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esav came in from the open, famished, eating, he came in from the sadeh, the field, the place that he is a man of. He's ish sadeh, right? He's the man of the field. And he, in Hebrew, modern Hebrew, ayef is is um, translated tired, but in biblical Hebrew, the word ayef is indeed used more to describe famished, hungry, and thirsty. And Asab said to Jacob, give me some of that red stuff, in Hebrew, ha'adom ha'adom this red, red thing, to gulp down. He uses in Hebrew the word hal'iteni, which is the word that's used to describe feeding an animal, like stuff an animal's face with food for I am famished, which is why he was named Edom. It's like the, the biblical editor kicks in and say he wants the red stuff and this is why later he will be called Edom. To which Jacob responds, Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. And in Hebrew, he adds another word, Kayom, this day. He insists, do it now. I'm not willing to accept a promise for some future date. Today, if you want this food, you need to agree to give me your bechora, your right of the firstborn. And Esav said, I am at the point of death. So of what youth is my birthright to me? I want to read it in the Hebrew. What he says is, I am going to die. I am about to die. What good is it for me? Why, should, why do I need bechora? birthright. But Jacob said, swear to me first, today, again, in the Hebrew, they didn't translate it, but in the Hebrew, it says today. It's, like, it's not enough that you're willing to do it. I want your promise on it. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob then gave us of bread and lentil stew. Only now it's revealed what is this red, red that Esav saw. He, here is Esav, ate and drank and he rose and went away. Thus did Esav spurn the birthright. This is one of the most verb Latin verses in the story here, especially in the Esav bit. It really comes verb, verb, verb. Ate, he drank, he got up, 
he left and he disdained the right of the firstborn. Five verbs in quick succession. So we see several things just looking at this scene. We see that their relationship is complicated. There are relationships where um, when one brother comes home famished, the other will be happy to serve him food without any negotiations involved. In fact, it's rather hard to see this scene and I feel a little bit critical, I think, of Jacob because, hello, your brother is famished and hungry and you're exploiting his weakness. There's a lot of commentators who commented on it that this action of Jacob is very calculated action kind of invites uh, scrutiny. It invites us wondering what's going on under the surface. It definitely shows us the relationship between the brothers is not a purely brotherly loving one. But at the same time, we see that they do have a relationship. In other words, Esav talks to Jacob and asks him for things. He doesn't just grab it. He doesn't overpower Jacob and take away something from him. And Jacob doesn't say, I don't wanna give you my food. But they're both engaging with each other, but the terms of their engagement are fraught with concern or with thought of the future event, of the future meaning of the right of the firstborn. Bechorah, the right of the firstborn, is only relevant after the father's death. And at least on Jacob's part, it's clear that his relationship with the sub is constantly haunted by his thought about what would happen after his father's death. What kind of relationship is going to exist between him and his brother? Which of them is going to be the firstborn? So that's what we know about the relationship. But of course, in interaction, we also learn about the people involved separately. And what I want to draw your attention to is that Esav is described throughout as someone who is very focused on the present tense. He is someone who describes the food he wants, not in terms of food, not calling it by its name. He describes it by its color. He uses a verb when he says, give me this food. Don't feed me. Don't serve me. Don't sell me. Don't hand it over. He says, stuff me with this food. There's a certain immediacy to the verb here. And when Jacob says, please sell me, I want to buy your right of the firstborn, Esav says a very interesting sentence. He says, I am about to die. What good is the right of the first one to me? Aviva Zornberg in her book, uh, The Murmuring Deep, makes this interesting point. She points out that we may be tempted to look at this question as meaning something childish and immediate. We may, we may look at it and say, oh, as I was saying, I'm starving, I'm starving, I'm starving, give me this food, I don't care, just give me this food, I'm starving because I'm so famished. But the truth is that he's making a philosophical statement here. He's making a much deeper statement. And his statement here at this passage is that one day I will die. My life is finite. So what do all those considerations about future inheritance and who has the right to lead the family after fathers, what, what do any of those considerations matter to me right now. Even if we think that the right of the firstborn merely means a financial arrangement of who gets the bigger part of the inheritance, he says, what does it matter to me that I'll have two, two birds in the end of father's life when I can get one bird, the food I want, right now, right now. He is a man who says, we all die. Everything is hevel, hevel havalim akol hevel. Everything is nothingness. At the end of our life, Wind goes round and round and the sun goes up and down and we all die in the end, like Ecclesiastes says um, over and over and over again in the book of Kohelet. So what does it matter? Why, why should we discuss the birthright, the various you know, structures of primacy within a family? It, it doesn't matter. What matters is what I do right now. He carpe diems in a very, very uh, powerful way. He lives in the moment. He achieved um, a form of nirvana, <laughs> in a sense, from thinking and worrying about the future by saying where I live, where I'm actually alive, is right now. And right now, this is what I want. So this is what I'm going to go for. 
Whereas Jacob comes from this scene as a man who is very invested in planning and calculating. He cooks the food, which means he took lentils, saw their potential, cooked them, prepared them, made them ready to be eaten. Then he sees his brother's hunger. He sees the opportunity, the potential for a deal. He negotiates, he makes the deal, and then he's generous. He gives his brother bread, not only a stew. Clearly he's not um, intent on just exploiting his brother. He, he wants to serve food to his brother, but he sees an opportunity and he thinks about what it means for the future. This difference between focusing on the present and focusing on the future may seem irrelevant, especially compared to the tragic events to follow. And yet I think it's extremely powerful and extremely important for three reasons. And these three reasons I think lie at the heart of the complicated relationship between Yaakov and Esau. First, it's important because Throughout the book of Genesis, we see time and time again that the person who is the most powerful or the most entitled within a given system is not necessarily the person who has God's promise for a meaningful life moving forward. We see time and time again how the older brother is rejected, even though the older brother is the one who's in terms of the status quo, in terms of the world they live in, is entitled is powerful, is uh, richer. It is the younger brother, the person who's chosen by God, who may seem less at a moment, in the moment of this time, who will inherit the future. And Jacob's focus on gaining a future marks him as another one in this line of younger brothers breaking forward or younger people or disadvantaged people, um, people who seem like they're not the ones that are most important or the most influential, who will, through planning, through faith of God, through events, forge the distant future. So we already see it hinted here in Jacob's uh, future orientation. This will come to play at the very end, and I'll make this comment, remind me if I forget, I will make a, a comment about the end of Esav and Jacob's relationship at the end of today's class um, that comes back to this difference, the difference between um, the long future and um, present riches, present affluence. The second reason that this difference between present orientation and future orientation is important is that present orientation may be alluring in the sense that it offers us the ability to live in the moment, to live life to the fullest, all those great slogans that we hear and we want to live and we want to experience. But in a way, it also takes away some of our liberty. Or perhaps I should say it offers us a very particular form of liberty but takes away another. It offer, offers us a liberty from worry because we focus on the present instead of worrying about the future. But it doesn't allow us the liberty, the kind of proactive liberty of taking our ideas, taking our values and shaping the world through them. Because in order to do that, we need to think ahead. We need to plan. We need to project what we believe in today into what we and other people will do tomorrow. There's a wonderful, wonderful book, nothing to do with Judaism, and yet a wonderful, <laughs> just perfect for this book, um, called Time and the Art of Living by Robert Gruden, where he shares a lot of reflections about time and what it means to live in time. If you read it, um, I'm sure it meant something to you, and if you haven't, I highly recommend it. And he talks about how when we focus too much on the present, um, we never create something of significance. I want to read here in the middle of the box. To those of us who spend entire days, if not lifetimes, concentrating on a series of brief and insignificant things, the present has barely any meaning at all. We may think we're living in the present, but what really happens is that the present passes and it leaves no mark. We become tiny, timorous things, caught in the inch of space between the in and the out box 
while we may share the common illusions about a mobile present and a free future, we spend most of our lives house cleaning the past. And later he says that we also shuffle backwards into the future. It says in a different spot, and I'm gonna go ahead, I'm go, going up here. I'm sorry that I'm jumping up and down, but I'm going up now to the earlier quote from the same book. He says the following. Um, Free men and women can think across time, viewing their own lives inclusive of past, present, and future as architectural holes, static and mental space. They can therefore see as others cannot, the cracks and buttresses of repeated action, the points of stress, the established framework. And as he says over and over and over again in this book, they can project who they are into the distant future. Esav, by focusing on the red and the feed me, feed me, feed me. And what do I care about the future when one day I'm gonna die and it's gonna be meaningless anyway. By focusing so hard on the carpe diem of the present moment, he is losing the ability to shape future events. He is choosing um, the gratification of right now over the calculated and intentional kind of action that's required um, to shape reality long term. And here, uh, finally, we see a difference between Jacob and Esau that is more than the color or who was holding whose heel or who was beloved by whom or who liked hunting and who liked sitting in tents. Here, we're seeing a real philosophical difference in their attitudes to life. So let's bear this difference between them in mind as we watch what happens next. And what happens next is one of the most emotionally charged um, sequences of scenes in the entire Hebrew Bible, in my opinion. And that's the moment when, encouraged by his mother, Jacob goes and steals and cheats his father, pretending to be Esav. It starts in box six. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim to see, he called his older son Esav and said to him, my son. They didn't have to say it. They could say, oh, he called his son and told him to do this and this. But there's intimacy here. Isaac looks at Esav and says, my son. And what does his son say? He says, Hineni, here I am. I am here for you. I am here in the moment. This is exact when Abraham took Isaac to be um, bound on the altar. Isaac said, Avi, my father. And Avram said, Hineni, here I am, my son. These are words that mark intimacy. And out of this intimacy and out of this love, Isaac asks his son Esav to go and hunt food and make him food and bring it to him. And he will do the following and jumping to verse four in the middle. Um, so that I may give you my innermost blessings before I die. So in Hebrew it says, so that my soul can bless you before I die. And Rebecca hears. And Rebecca takes events into her own hands. Rebecca tells, said to Jacob, her son. Esav is described as Isaac's son. Jacob is her son. And she tells him, here is what your father said. Now do the following. And she tells him here, I'm jumping to verse eight. Now my son, listen carefully as I instruct you, go to the flock and fetch me two choice kids and I will make of them a dish for your father such as he likes. Then take it to your father to eat in order that he may bless you before he dies. Jacob answered his mother, Rebecca, but my father, as my brother Esau is a hairy man and I am smooth skinned. If my father touches me, I shall appear to him as a trickster and bring upon myself a curse, not a blessing. Aviva Zornberg points out that the word he's using when he says, if my father touches me, I shall appear to him, are very particular. He doesn't say, im yemusheni achi, which would mean if, a neutral if. He says, ulai yemusheni avi. Ulai has the intention, the connotations of desire. It's wistful. Perhaps my father will touch me. And it's almost as if he's hoping that his father will touch him. Why 
does the text use this word? Why is Jacob using a word that expresses a desire to be touched when being touched is dangerous for him because it can reveal his deception and bring a curse upon himself? Aviva Zorenberg suggests that perhaps this is a moment of a Freudian slip when we see underneath um, Jacob's immediate concern about being discovered, we see his deeper concern, his deeper desire, suppressed perhaps. He wants to be touched by his father. This is the boy who watches his father preferring the other son. This is the boy who doesn't have his father's favor. This is the boy who, in order to be blessed by his father, thinks he's going to have to deceive him. And there's this desire for acknowledgement. There's this desire to be seen and touched by his father that complicates the emotional resonance of the situation. His mother says, you know what? If he curses you, it's on me. And he goes and he does what he said. And um, he comes to his father. I'm jumping ahead to box eight. Unfortunately, we're trying to cover such a intense scene that I can't stop and read every piece separately. He went to his father and said, father, and he said, yes, here I am. Which of my sons are you? That's not exactly what he says. He says, he nanny, here I am. That's what Isaac says to him. Me atapni, who are you, my son? Once again, just like with Rebecca's question, where she said, why should I exist? Lama ze Just like with Asav's question, when he said, I'm going to die tomorrow, so why do I need uh, what good is for me at the right of the firstborn? This question too is not a specific question, but it rather takes the story to kind of a broader plane. It introduces a bigger issue. Here comes the father and tells the son, who are you, my son? And in the immediate scene, what it means is, are you a Sav or are you Jacob? You just called me my father, but two people have the right to say my father. So which one are you? But on a deeper level, Jacob is standing there, shattering with fear that his father will discover the uh, deception even as he craves to be seen for himself by his father on some deeper level. And he is asked, who are you? Who are you? Perhaps the biggest question a person can be asked in the world. And he lies. He says, I am a sub, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Pray, sit up, and eat of my game, that you may give me your innermost blessing. This is a wound. This is a trauma. To be asked who you are by your father in a solemn moment and lie is not just a trauma. It's not just a wound in the relationship. It's a trauma for the self. It means that at the moment that you were called upon to be most yourself, you covered who you are. As we will see in our following lessons, this is a trauma that Jacob deals with and relives over and over and over again um, in many relationships in his life. It's like many of his relationships are reworking this moment, this moment of setting himself aside. And a lot of his story is figuring out what's the real answer to the question, who are you? What's the honest answer to this question? But this is in the future. What's relevant for this scene is that Isaac asks again and again, as if he suspects, and he even asks to touch him. And he says in verse 21, uh, come closer so that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son as sub or not. And when he feels him, he says, the voice is the voice of Jacob, yet the hands are the hands of Esau. And yet Isaac is deceived and he gives him the blessing. And it's a very extensive blessing that says you will have all these physical advantages, wonderful land, rain, et cetera, et cetera. And more to the point and of the relationship between Jacob and his brother, I'm in verse 29, let people serve you and nations bow to you, be master over your brothers and let your mother's sons bow to you. Jacob lives, leaves in the same moment, just as he leaves, Esav comes in. And when Esav says, come and bless me, and Esav says, wait a minute, who are you? And he says, I am your eldest Esav. For the first time, frankly, in the entire story of Isaac, we have 
a glimpse into Isaac's internal experience. I'm in verse 33. Isaac was seized with very violent trembling. In Hebrew. Who was it then, he demanded, that hunted game and brought it to me? Moreover, I ate it before you came and I blessed him. Now he must remain blessed. And now we gain also an insight into Esav. When Esav heard his father's words, he burst into wild and bitter sobbing and said to his father, bless me too, father. Which Isaac does, but reluctantly. First, he tells him, what can I give you as a blessing? I already blessed him that he will be master over you. And Esav cries and says, what, you only have one blessing? And in the end, Isaac gives him a blessing. He says, I'm in verse 39. And his father, Isaac, answered, saying to him, see, your abode shall enjoy the fat of the earth and the dew of the heaven above. Yet by your sword, you shall live and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restive, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Over history, many commentators asked, what is this clause, but when you grow restive? In Hebrew, it's v'haya ka'asher tarid, which is an odd verb that doesn't appear in this form in other places. And again, Rabbi Yonatan Grossman in his book has an interesting suggestion. He points out, and he's basing it on other people who, that he's quoting, Rabbi Yaakov Asis and other people, who point out that tarid in... Um, other Mesopotamian languages and dialects have the meaning of wander, of travel. And in a sense, it's as if as Isaac is saying, you will be your father, your brother's servant. You will serve your brother's brother until you travel away. If you don't want to be locked in the struggle with him where you are doomed to lose because I gave him the blessing of dominion over you. If you don't want to be locked in this, the only way out is to leave. As long as you two are part of the same system, there's always going to be those tensions. You're always going to be running after each other or fighting with each other just like you did in your mother's womb. There's always going to be this feeling that things don't quite align. There's always going to be a tension between the man who wants the now and the man who carefully calculates the future and is willing to deceive and take advantage on his way to it. The only way to take this tension out of your relationship and allow you, Esav, to have your own life where you're not a servant of your brother is for you to walk away. In effect, this is what happens. Even though the first to walk away is not Esau, it's Jacob. When his mother hears that his father, that his brother wants to kill him, she sends him to run away to her brother's house. She talks to Isaac, lying to him. She's not lying, she's using the truth, but she manipulates Isaac by telling him that she doesn't want Jacob to marry a local woman. So then Isaac also sends Jacob out but instead of telling him, run away from your brother, he says, go and find a wife in your uncle, uncle, sorry, uncle's house in Haran. And as we said in the beginning, Vayetse. Jacob leaves the system he grew up in. He leaves the family drama um, that he occupied his own life. He leaves the childhood home he grew up in, and he has to figure out new terms for his life. Much of what happens to Jacob in the next uh, section that we will discuss next week, his marriages and the beginning of his uh, life as a father, is him wrestling exactly with that, with what does it mean to stand on his own? What does it mean to be Jacob who is no longer tied to his brother? Jacob who becomes Israel, uh, a name that no longer emphasizes that when he was born, he held his brother's heel, that no longer just ties him to this relationship. And a lot of his uh, life is going to be about how to become a man that can spring forth from the family that raised him, but stand as a man on his own right. And when he will come back, we will see this um, kind of foreshadowing what will happen after next week, after our next discussion. We will see that in fact, indeed, the brothers do separate. Esav goes to Sa'il, 
Yaakov goes to Canaan, and each of them build their own life. I want to say one more comment, and then I will take a few minutes to answer some of the questions. I just want to say one more comment. Um, we're leaving today kind of at frayed hand, at frayed ends. We can't say that we close the story because Jacob's story continues. But I do want to talk for a moment about what happens in the final meeting, in the final reunion between Jacob and Esau. We just read it in Shuls. Those who uh, read the Torah in Shuls, we just read it this week. We read about how Jacob was scared, but then Esav ran towards him to hug him and kiss him. Again, kind of closing the circle with the running that the two boys did inside their mother's womb. And we see that Esav invites Jacob to come with him. And Jacob says, oh, I have young children. I have all these sheep. I'll go leiti. I will go slowly and I will meet you eventually. And then the next chapter tells us about Esav's great success, about how he had all these children who were great leaders and kings and alufim, champions. And in here, in the difference between Esav, who's building an empire right now in his lifetime with 400 men armies following him hither and thither and great leaders springing forth right away. And Jacob, who walks slowly and lives in Sukkot and temporary structures, and yet follows a calling that God himself calls him, we see another iteration on the same difference between the man who wants things now and the man who builds for the future. And we see how these personal differences will um, play on the international relationships that will uh, spring forth from their descendants. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, I'll take some of the questions from the comments for those who uh, can stay for a little longer. Um, I won't have time to go over everything. Um, Suri Rudolph asked, when Jacob ages and loses his sight and asks about Ephraim and Menashe, me ele, like Isaac, me uh, atabni. Oh, I think it's a comment, right? Not a question, but... Uh, uh, this is a very beautiful, I didn't think about it. This is a beautiful connection that um, Jacob will give a blessing to children that he would also be asking about at the end of his life. Um, someone else wrote, Isaac dies much later than the day of the two blessings. And this exaggeration, um, is this exaggeration an echo of the day Jacob brought the blessings from his brother who also talked about dying? Um, do you want to elaborate what you mean? What's the exact, what, I don't understand the context of the question. Um, so, okay, so I'll try and answer it. Um, yes. Uh, Jacob, uh, Asaf doesn't die in the day he says, you know, if I don't have the food, mm -hmm. I'm going to die. And Isaac dies more than 20 years later. Mm -hmm. because uh, oh. and not until after Jacob comes home. So there's an exaggeration in both counts. Oh, I see. You say, he says, give me food, so I'll bless you before I die. Right, right, right. I understand what you're saying. Um, it's an interesting echo. Yeah, that's an interesting parallel. I didn't think about it. I think it's a little different just in the sense that uh, Isaac um, is thinking about the future. He's thinking what will happen after his death. In other words, Isaac, when he thinks about death, wants to leave his affairs in order so that they move forward in an orderly way. Whereas when Seth thinks about his death, his conclusion is focus on the present, the future doesn't matter. So in a sense, it's a really beautiful parallel that you're drawing because it highlights the difference as much as it highlights the similarity. So thank you. Thank you for this comment. Um, a moment. Um, Elena Lubin wrote, Esav is described as a man of the field, and in the sale of the birthright, he maintains that sort of image. Yaakov is described as a Ishtam who stays home, and yet when he sees him in his home, he seems to be anything but an Ishtam, uh, innocent man, calculating and planning how to get the birthright. So I want to I, I want to thank you for the comment. It's a good comment, and I, I want to say something about that. That. Um, we have millennia of conditioning behind us in which we think that tmimut, tam, being kind of someone who's wholesome or innocent means that 
um, you're also naive and kind of simple in the way you think about the world that you don't calculate, you don't think ahead, you don't uh, negotiate. Um, I'm not sure that that's the meaning of the word here. I'm not sure that we can carry these kind of connotations that we associate with this word now back into the biblical story. Because in the biblical story, we see time and time again, people who are very calculating, and Jacob is a leading example of this, as we will see in his dealings with his father-in-law. People are very calculating and very careful, carefully planning how to manipulate events to their advantage that are described as perfectly righteous and uh, perfectly um, wholesome because they're doing it in a fair way. Does this description survive the deceit that Yaakov perpetuates on his father? That's already a, a harder and challenging question. And I wanna make another comment on that, namely that um, a lot of the commentators to this day, from beginning to this day, focus on the question of was, were Rebecca and Yaakov right to deceive Isaac? Or some say they were totally right. Some say their purpose was right, but the means were wrong. Some say Rebecca misunderstood the situation. Jacob only, um, Isaac meant to give one blessing to us, but he always meant to also give a different blessing to Jacob. There's a lot of different answers. What I was trying today is not to answer the question of right and wrong, but rather to watch their relationship. And in terms of the relationship, the cost is real. No matter what you say about the right and wrong in philosophical terms or in terms of the future of the Jewish people, the, the family falls apart. The family um, is um, broken after this event. And there's something very touching, which we didn't touch upon. Okay, I didn't mean the alliteration, the pun not intended here, um, which is that after all of this, after Isaac sends Yaakov away, after Asav deals with it, after Asav is so angry and hurt, Asav sees that his father asked Jacob to go and marry a girl in Haran, and he realizes that his wives are, lo his local wives that he married are bad in the eyes of Ha'ot Be'enei, his parents, so he goes and marries Ishmael's daughter, his cousin. So even after all of that, he wants to do what is right in his parents' eyes. He cares about their opinion. He cares about their comfort, their love, their relationship between them. And it's almost as if the biblical storyteller added this detail there so we wouldn't make things too easy for Jacob in our minds. So we wouldn't just dismiss what Jacob and Rebecca did as, oh yeah, they cheated, but Esav deserved it. No. Even at the end, we see Esav caring about his parents and uh, caring about what they, um, what they uh, desire. Um, okay, so unfortunately I have to go. My family needs me here and I don't have time to answer more questions. Um, you're welcome. I'm going to once again um, write my Gmail in the comments. No, just a minute. Gmail. Um, so you're welcome to send them to me. Um, thank you very much for being here. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you next week and discussing. Um, so Maxine, please tell us, do we have classes during Hanukkah? We have class next week? Um, yes, there is class next week. Okay, so I'm looking forward to seeing you all next week and discussing the convoluted life life, love life of uh, this man who's now leaving home. Thank you, everybody. And, and Maxine, I'm giving it back to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I think that it's possible that some of these uh, questions that uh, people have might uh, be able to be addressed further on. They might, you know, as you were saying, um, these patterns keep getting repeated. So um, yeah, hopefully uh, people will be able to join us to continue the discussion. Um, Thank you so much for coming and I won't keep people any longer. Um, of course, there's a class uh, this afternoon um, at one o'clock with uh, Rabbi uh, Dr. Aaron Adler on um, uh, the Rav's uh, Hanukkah. That's uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik, of course. And I hope that uh, you join us again soon. Um, 
if not uh, this afternoon or next week uh, for any of our other classes. Uh, thank you so much. Have a good afternoon, uh, a good evening. Bye.